Welcome back to Financial Markets Microstructure. And in today's lecture, we will be talking about markets and the effect of public information. Before that, let us uh, get back one week and talk about last Wednesday, where we started talking about high-frequency trading, and we considered one model of high-frequency trading. And what we saw was that HFT basically generates endogenously informational asymmetries between traders. So having high-frequency traders in the market is similar to having more informed traders in the market, which, um, as usual, ha uh, harms liquidity, widens the spread, just from the usual informed trading concerns. But in this case, it does not really foster that much of a price discovery. So it speeds up price discovery by a little bit, but given that we're thinking that these high-frequency traders get access to the same information as everyone else, except they do it faster, this issue uh, means that existence of high-frequency traders does not actually lead to better price discovery. But what we did not do last week is we did not actually finish the lecture. And we have some more things about high-frequency trading that I wanted to cover. So with that, let us get to last week's slides. And talk about this uh, model, talk about this paper from Budish, Crampton and Shim, which is once again about high-frequency trading. So they claim that high-frequency trading is like an arms race in the sense that there is some perpetual wasteful investment in gaining advantage, right? You want to be better than everyone else, you want to be faster than everyone else, but when everything is, when everyone is fast, um, it's, it's the same as when everyone is slow, except everyone has invested a lot of money into getting fast, so it is wasteful. And they have some data to back that up, which I will show. And they have a simple model to back that up, which will be which will be quite similar in the idea to the paper to the model that we've seen last week. And they also propose a solution to this problem. And they say that this arms race is kind of baked into the trading mechanism. It's baked into the continuous auction, and as long as we keep holding continuous auctions, um, well, the high frequency trading will be a problem. So what they do is they propose to replace the continuous auction with frequent batch auctions and by frequent they mean really frequent like 10 auctions a second so it should not be it should not create a significant delay to any traders who want to buy or sell stocks but it should eliminate the high frequency trading problem any problems that HFT can generate. So let us start by looking at the main idea that they had. And the idea is that um, one of the benefits of HFT comes from the fact that even assets that should generate correlated returns these kinds of assets are not perfectly correlated on short enough time intervals. So if you are really, really fast, you have access to these extra arbitrary opportunities between similar or identical assets. And these arbitrage opportunities do not vanish over time. Meaning that competition will not make them disappear, meaning that the entry of more HFT traders attracted by these profits will not really eliminate these arbitrage opportunities and will not foster the correlation between identical assets. So this is an example of the data that they provide. What you see in this graph is price data from two very similar assets. So both of these assets track S&P 500 the industrial uh, overall economy index for the US. And here, SPY, the green line, is an 
ETF, Exchange Traded Fund, which tracks S&P 500, meaning that if you want to have S&P 500 in your portfolio, you do not need to actually buy these 500 different kinds of stocks. You can just buy SPY. And that would add S&P 500 to your portfolio. ES, on the other hand, is an S&P 500 future contract. So if you buy a unit of ES today, you will have to repay uh, the seller. You will have to return them the value of S&P 500 as it will be in one week. So you see that these two are quite, quite correlated. And these are not exactly the same asset, right? So one is spot contract, another is a future contract. But this future contract is very short term. Well, relatively short term, it's just one week. And when you think about price efficiency, right? About current prices reflecting all of our information about the future value of this um, fundamental value, then S&P 500 is is the place for this price efficiency to hold. So if you think that prices are ever price efficient, uh, prices are ever efficient, they will be efficient for these S&P 500 future contracts, meaning that the value of a future contract today perfectly reflects the expected value of uh, S&P 500 in one week. And as we know, prices are Martingales when they are efficient, meaning that the expected value of the future um, of S&P 500 in a week from now should be exactly equal to the value of S&P 500 today, plus the risk-free return, plus maybe some small risk premium. So the two axes for the two assets are not exactly the same, and the two are staggered, just for you to be able to see them. For them to be not be able to perfectly coincide. Okay, so this data comes from one trading day, from 8.30 a.m. to what 3.30 p.m. And as you see, the prices of the two seem very, very correlated. Almost the same thing, right? So let us enhance and zoom in on, say, a trading hour. So let's take a trading hour from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. and see whether uh, everything is still everything still looks the same. So from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. You see that it still looks the same. The two price indices are still very much correlated. They still look pretty much the same. Let us enhance some more into one trading minute from 1.51 p.m. to 1.52 p.m. Now you see that something might actually be happening. So they are still more or less the same, but you see that ES maybe has some delay, or maybe is more discreet, I don't know, but maybe has some delay in reflecting the values uh, of SPY, in incorporating the information that was revealed uh, in SPY trading. Now let us enhance even more. So this was one trading minute. This is a quarter of a second. So one thing you can do here is, of course, marvel at how much trading actually happens within a quarter of a second and how much price dynamics there is within a quarter of a second. But once you're done doing that, you can see that the correlation between the two actually vanishes somewhat. So they are not, these two price indices are no longer one to one, but they are expected to, their values are expected to converge to one another over longer periods of time, meaning that there are arbitrage opportunities. So if you think that ES is currently overvalued compared to SPY, you can buy ES, you can sell SPY, no vice versa, you should sell ES because it's too expensive, you should buy SPY because it's cheap, and then when the prices align, 
when the price is realigned again, you can sell. So this is arbitrage. These are arbitrary opportunities. So this, this graph shows you the correlation between these two price indices um, for different years as a function of the time scale that we look at. And there are three things you can look at here, three things you can notice. Firstly, this correlation increases with time interval. So the bigger is the scope that you look at, the more correlated these two price indices are, which is what we just saw. They move almost exactly the same when we look at the scale of even one trading day or hour. But once we zoom in, this correlation vanishes. The second observation is that it begins to grow faster with time. So in 2005, the correlation at even a 100 millisecond interval was quite low, but it increased drastically um, throughout two th through two th 2011. Through to 2011. And you can interpret this as more and more high frequency traders entering the market and trying to exploit these arbitrary opportunities. And in the end, um, introducing this, improving price efficiency on these small price intervals. But the third thing you can see is that as this time interval shrinks to zero, the correlation is robustly zero. Meaning that the fastest traders who can operate on a few milliseconds notice will always have these have access to these arbitrage opportunities which will attract new traders which hopefully should eliminate arbitrage but as you see it doesn't really so these arbitrage opportunities for very very fast traders they persist over time and the same point is also illustrated by this following graph uh, it shows you median profits per arbitrage over time. And you see that these do not decline. So profits per arbitrage are more or less consistent over time. They are more or less robust. They are more or less at the same level. So once again, they do not vanish over time as more high-frequency traders enter the market. So let us look at a simple model which can try to explain it. In this model, we have, as usual, just one asset. And there is a public signal Y, which is perfectly correlated with the value, with the fundamental value of this asset X. Meaning that the fundamental value of the asset is commonly known to everybody. It is announced throughout through these signals, but it might change over time. In particular, we will assume that uh, these public signal and fundamental value follow a compound Poisson distribution. So what this means is that as time goes on, at some random exponential times, there will arrive a discontinuous jump in the value. So time goes on. The jump arrives, uh, the value changes. Then this value is constant again until the next jump arrives. And these jumps arrive at some rate that we'll call lambda jump. And they have a random size, j, which also follows some distribution, f jump. Now, there are two types of traders in the market. On the one hand, there are our known and loved noise traders. And they arrive according to some, once again, Poisson process with the rate lambda i, lambda invest. So they also arrive randomly over time. They are not always in the market, but they do arrive at random times. And whenever a noise trader arrives, they want to either buy or sell one unit of the asset, And they are, they are just random in what they want to buy. So 
The paper says that they use marketable limit orders. I don't think it's really important. We can just assume that they use market orders to do so. Now, on the other side of the market are HFTs, the high frequency traders. In particular, in particular, we will say that there are n high frequency trading firms who use market or limit orders. So there is no single centralized dealer, but HFT uh, will be the liquidity providers. And now, an important assumption here is that if there are multiple orders or messages that arriving at the exact same time, they will be processed in random order. So one of those will be uniformly chosen at random to be the first, then the second one will be drawn again uniformly and so on. So as I said, HFTs will, will serve the role of liquidity providers. And in particular, what we'll assume will happen is that one high frequency trader endogenously takes the role of liquidity provider. So there will be one firm which will be posting quotes, bid and ask for one unit of the asset. And we'll refer to this firm as the market maker, as usual. But to emphasize once again, there is no dedicated market maker. So it's just one of the HFTs that takes this role at random. All of the other high frequency traders will act as stale quote snipers, meaning they will keep track of the market maker's quotes. And if they get to observe the public news before this market maker, before the market maker observes their updates their quotes, then they will be able to snipe these stale quotes. So there will likely be scope for this arbitrage for either buying an asset whose value has just gone up at a non-updated low price or vice versa. If asset price has gone down, then HFTs can uh, do a short sell or regular sell if they have this asset in stock. So we have already said that Y is our signal. Let's say that ask and bid prices will just be given by Y plus or minus half spread, S over 2. And we will not look carefully at S. No, we will. I think we will determine it in equilibrium. So what happens when news arrive? If news arrive and there is new the asset value is known to change, to have changed from Y to Y prime, then the market maker will send a message to the exchange immediately to cancel their old quotes A and B, which were centered around the old Y, and they will submit a new quote, new pair of quotes A prime and B prime, centered around this new value Y prime. Noise traders are assumed to be slower at receiving news. So whenever news arrives, all high frequency traders get to act first. But all high frequency traders get access to these news at the same time. So they will submit these orders simultaneously. And snipers will trade, of course, if there is profits, if there are profits from arbitrage, uh, meaning that if change in Y is very, very small, they will probably not trade. They will not have reasons to trade. But this is not particularly important. Now let us compute the profits of different kinds of high-frequency firms. First let us look at market maker. The expected flow profits of the market maker, meaning profit per some small time period dt, as normalized by dt. So if you get flow profit of 1, meaning that you on average get $1 per unit of time, per minute, per second, whatever is your unit of time is. 
So what this flow profit is? With rate lambda invest, there will be an uninformed trader arriving to the market. There will be a noise trader who submits an order. In that case, this order will be executed and the market maker will get S over 2 in profits due to the spread. But another event that may occur is that there will be a news arriving at any given time, right? So with the rate lambda jump, the fundamental value of the asset changes and uh, signal Y is generated or regenerated. In that case, if that happens and size of the jump is greater than the half spread, the market maker will receive an order from the snipers. So the snipers will try to snipe this tail quote with probability 1 over n this does not work for fractions with probability 1 over n the market maker will be the first to submit the message to the exchange and will be able to cancel their quotes but the probability n minus n over 1 um, the sniping order will be processed first so whenever a news arrives, once again the market maker sends a message to cancel all quotes and all the snipers send their market orders. All of these N messages arrive at the exchange simultaneously and the exchange processes them in random order. So with probability N minus 1 over N, one of the snipers will be able to execute at the stale quotes. If that happens, the profit of the market maker or the loss of the market maker will be given by the difference between the new um, between the new value of y y prime and the old price so you can rewrite it as the size of the jump minus the half spread because the half spread is the profit that the market maker would have received on on the old uh, if y did not change So once again, market maker receives some profit from trading with informed investors, from trading with uninformed noise traders, and loses with some probability if he is sniped by one of fellow high-frequency traders. Now we can also look at the snipers, and I've already explained all that happens. So they get to trade with probability lambda jump. They have a profitable trading opportunity if j is greater than s over 2. They are the first to trade with probability 1 over n. So they get the snipe with probability 1 over n. And if all that happens, they get profit of j minus s over 2. This was a loss for the market maker. This is a profit to the sniper. And once we are, when we are computing these profits from the Exante perspective, we take the expectation of these... Um, or these trading profits and losses, once again conditional on the jump being large enough to generate a profitable trading opportunity. As we said, we want the self-selection into roles to be endogenous. So we want high-frequency traders to... We want one of them to become uh, the market maker and we can allow everyone else to be the sniper but we want it to be worth it to become a market maker right because if market makers always get sniped no one will want to be any no one will want to be a market maker so hfts should be indifferent between adopting either of the two roles meaning that the expected profit of the market maker should be equal to the expected profit of a sniper if we write down this indifference condition, we will obtain this equality. So you'll have to rewrite things a little bit, but that's what you get in the end. So this equilibrium condition will determine the equilibrium spread S, given the remainder uh, of parameters of the model, given the lambdas, given the distribution of j. 
And the big takeaway here is that this spread, as determined in equilibrium, by this equilibrium condition, does not depend on n. Let me try again. Does not depend on n. So if you look at this expression, n just does not enter anywhere. Meaning that however many high frequency traders are attracted to the market by these arbitrage opportunities, the, this will not change the spread. This will not improve the liquidity in the market. This will not narrow down the prices that noise traders face. So in this sense, having more high frequency traders does not really affect anything that happens in the market. It does not benefit the market explicitly. So this was their argument for showing that high frequency trading is bad. And they said that there will be a positive bid ask spread whenever you still have continuous market. Even as the number of informed traders, even the, if the number of high frequency traders converges to infinity. And as I told you at the very beginning, this is despite no asymmetric information. So we assume that there is this uh, public news in the market, right? But what happens is that high frequency traders get to observe these news first, or some of them do before others, which generates this risk of informed trading, even though there is no informed trading per se, because again, these news will be acquired by everybody. But this spread persists as if informed trading was in place. As if there was a risk of some traders having private information, which is kind of bad. Right, so authors argue that this is actually bad, that this is a market failure. And this happens due to continuous market. So what they propose is to have a frequent batch auction. So say auction every T moments. And if a fast and slow institution have some latencies delta fast and delta slow. Highlighter is not perfect, eh? Uh, so if auctions happen every T moments and fast and slow institutions have some latencies, that then uh, something will happen. So we can draw it, right? Suppose that this is the time axis. This is time zero. This is time tau. So the question is, how early do traders need to submit their orders in order for these orders to be executed in the time tau auction? The uninformed traders, sorry, the slow traders, will have to submit those by time tau minus delta s so at any time before this fast institutions however have smaller latency meaning that they have later cutoff for submitting the orders so they will be able to trade at any point they'll be able to submit their orders at any point up to tau minus delta f, which is a larger time interval. Meaning that you'll have three periods in every kind of auction period. There will be a period in which both fast and slow traders can trade. Meaning that if public news arrives at this point in time, both fast and slow institutions will be able to incorporate it into their orders. But if public information arrives in this middle interval, then only the fast institutions will be able to incorporate it. And if it arrives during this time, then, um, well, on the one hand, you can say that no one will be able to incorporate it, for the auction at time t, uh, time tau. So let's say nobody for time tau. 
but both fast and slow institutions will be able to incorporate this information in the next auction. So a time to tau. I apologize for the handwriting. So the delay is inefficient. But if tau is small, the, this inefficiency is kind of also small, right? So the idea that the authors have is that if you make this tau large enough to make this middle interval small enough in comparison, right? So if we draw another line in which tau um, is big, And here tau was very small. Then if tau is big, what will happen is this will be tau minus delta f. Try again, f. And this will be tau minus delta s. Try again, delta s. So the second interval that we've talked about will be this. I hope you can see it. It's kind of small, but that's the point. The point is, if tau is big, the relative length of this t second time interval during which the kind of this asymmetric information arises, the informed trading happens, the relative length of this interval will be small relative to the rest, relative to this first and third interval, information from which can be used by both fast and slow traders. So the relative length of the second interval vanishes, meaning that the informed trading problem kind of also vanishes. And they give A numbers example. So if they say the difference in reaction times of the two of fast and slow institutions is 100 millisecond microseconds, which is um, 0.1 millisecond, and you hold 10 auctions a second, meaning that tau is 100 milliseconds, then the length of that second interval is 1 over a thousand. So only one piece of news in a thousand will be able to be used by high frequency traders. While for everything else, you'll have symmetric information and uh, there will be no this kind of s sniping, stale quote sniping. Now, this numbers example is a little cheeky because this delta is probably too small, right? The difference between fast and slow traders is probably larger than 0.1 of a millisecond. It might be, well, at least one, two, and probably a few milliseconds. And here I'm implying that, you know, as we saw last time, even these large uninformed institutional investors are using algorithms. So they are able to react fast, they are able to trade fast, maybe just not as fast as the high frequency traders who intentionally minimize their latency. So if you have delta of a few microseconds, then, so, sorry, milliseconds, different things, of a few milliseconds and uh, you have tau one second or 10 seconds, you can still maintain this ratio to a very low level. So moving from a continuous market to relatively frequent batch auctions, can be a solution to high frequency traders arms race and this is the big conclusion of their model and this concludes everything that we have le had left to cover from last week so the big takeaway here is is just as i said at the very beginning high frequency trading can create the same consequences as informed trading but the problem is it creates them even when there is no actual private information. Meaning that more 
informed trading by high frequency traders does not does not have any benefits it does not foster price discovery it may speed up price discovery by a small margin but probably not enough for us to see it as a real benefit so if there are no questions let me begin to actually move to our topic from this week which is the effect of public information on markets we will start a little bit and we will go to the break a little bit after so i'll just wait a second here for questions if any Okay, I guess there are none, so let us dive into the fantastic world of public information. So, in what we've covered so far, we've mostly looked at the effects of asymmetric information, private signals, right? And H of T was one departure from that, where we try to replicate that through speed rather than real private information. So, we've roughly had two kinds of models, where there was either symmetric uncertainty, as install model, so no one knew the asset price equally, or we had asymmetric uncertainty, so some private information, as in mo many of the models that we've seen. Gloston Milgram, Kyle, uh, some of the others. But we rarely looked at the at the effect of overall volatility of global uncertainty on prices and on trade on the markets in general so in all in many of these models we have briefly talked about say what are the effects of larger volatility of this fundamental value on trade but it was rarely interesting and um, in particular all of the models that we've seen are inconsistent with reality at um, some level in particular, there is this very prominent, very robust empirical observation, which is that public announcements often generate high trading volumes. And this is counterintuitive in the models that we've seen so far, uh, as we will briefly see now in our simple example. So we will look at a model by, at a paper by Peter Condor from 2012, which tries to address it. And it can explain, it tries to explain this uh, high trading volume after public announcements through higher order beliefs. Now, let us first quickly talk about what are higher order beliefs. If you have heard this before, it was probably in a game theory course, and it was something very theoretical and very abstract, and you forgot about it very quickly including in the game theory course, right? So higher order beliefs are something that's mostly very theoretical, but has gained some traction recently in trying to explain empirical phenomena. And this is one of the papers that does it, one of the papers that does it. Higher order beliefs are a concept that arrives in multiplayer games. So in these games with some kind of uncertainty, with some kind of incomplete information, uh, say there is some common state theta, which is not perfectly observed by any player. But all players observe some signal xi about this state theta. In this case, player 1 will have some expectation of theta given theta 1. This will be this player's first order beliefs. However, this is not enough for us to determine how player one will behave in equilibrium. I mean, it often is, but sometimes it isn't. So many games are constructed in such a way that uh, it isn't. In particular, what also affects player one's behavior is the behavior of player two, right? So in order to figure out how to optimally act in a game, I need to know how everyone else will act, meaning that 
from his signal x1 the player one also tries to predict how others will behave so they will player one will also try to figure out what player two will think what player two's signal x2 will be how it will shape player two's expectation of theta and thus the actions so player one will have to form some expectation of the conditional expectation of theta by player two given player one's uh, signal x1 so this is what we call second order beliefs so it's player one's beliefs about player two's beliefs but then you have this infinite loop arising right because player two's behavior will also depend on what he thinks about player one's behavior so player two will also form some expectation of player one's expectations and player one needs to form a conjecture about that so player one will have a belief about player two's belief about player one's belief and so on so this generates an infinite hierarchy and the fact that it's infinite is the discouraging factor right it's something we don't like to think about it's it would be really inconvenient to work with so in most games these higher order beliefs just collapse to the first order beliefs so they are reduced to something similar but in this game the second order beliefs will be irrelevant so let us look at a simple example of how public information works in model that we've seen so far which is the very simple uh, lost and milgram model so we have an asset with value theta which is formed out of two components theta one and theta two both can be minus one zero or one and they are independent and they are equiprobable for simplicity now as usual with we have uh, chance pi of a trader being informed of a trader being a speculator and if this happens the trader observes theta two so one component of this uh, value and with probability one minus pi our trader is uninformed in which case they just buy or sell with equal probability without conditioning on theta two we do however assume that both agents will observe public signal y equal to theta one and even though i spoiled the answer already i'll just do a quick blitz quiz for you so how does the public signal in this problem affect the outcomes uh, if how does the outcome on theta one is higher compared to the outcome on theta one is lower does it affect the mid price does it affect the spread does it affect both or neither so give me your answers in chat once the time runs out i forgot to put the numbers again but one two three four One, two, three, four. Any volunteers? Is everyone asleep? Quite possible. Four. So we have one guess at four. You've got to revisit that Gloucester Milgram model because the right answer is two. So let's look at what actually happens. Uh, if we look at how prices are formed, something that we've done many times already in this course, is we want to we want these ask prices. We want the ask price, for example, to be a conditional expectation of the fundamental value v. So theta one plus theta two. I guess this should be expectation of theta conditional on the information available to the traders theta one and the order being a buy order you 
because all all market participants get to observe theta one, including the dealer. This is not actually written in here, right? It just says public signal. But this is the part that might have confused you. So the dealer knows that if uh, the signal was theta one and the the order comes from the noise trader then the expected value conditional on this information that the dealer has is just theta one all right the dealer gets no information from the uninformed traders order but the dealer gets information from theta one and if the dealer if the trader is informed then they buy because the asset is actually worth a lot meaning that uh, theta one plus theta two will be equal to theta one plus one and uh, if you compute the probability of a trader being informed condition on the order being a buy order you will have this fraction so this is the probability of informed trader times one and you see that different trading different public information theta one will just move these ask prices around higher or lower but the same will apply to the bid price right bid price will be higher or lower and uh, this term which is our half spread this is horrible i have bad control of the mouse today for some reason this term does not this half spread does not depend on theta one so it's constant so in our model we have mid price changing in response to the public information but the spread doesn't and the spread here is one measure of trading volume i guess so you could um, i guess it's hard to talk about trading volume in this particular model but if you say that theta two is distributed for example uniformly so it's rich enough then you'll have heterogeneous then you'll have many different probabilities for uh, informed trading the probability of informed trading will possibly vary in equilibrium but it, it will not depend still on the public signal so trading volume does not react to public signal and what happens with public signal in this Gloston Milgram model is just that the dealer cancels old quotes and uh, submits new quotes, publishes new quotes. But no trade actually happens in response to this private information, to this public information. It's just all agents in the market simultaneously update their opinion about the valuation of the asset. And in particular, higher order beliefs are of no importance in this model. Everyone only cares about the expected value of the asset so why is that because we explicitly assumed this in gloston milgram model we literally assume that all agents only care about the fundamental value of the asset this is the value that they expect to get in particular the this model does not feature any resale so when someone buys the asset they do not expect to sell it meaning that they do not need to think about the price at which they sell it and this selling price might actually depend on on the next buyer's opinion about uh, theta but if you think about resale then trader who buys an asset today will have to form some expectation about the beliefs of future trader to whom uh, our today's buyer will sell the asset eventually we have already seen one model with resale in this course which was Duffy Garliano and Pedersen model of OTC trading so this uh, model today will have a somewhat of a similar flavor but it will be simpler in some respects and more difficult in other respects so it will not be an infinite period model but it will be a model with asymmetric information which we did not have in Duffy Gardiano and Pedersen and so this model uh, you will have kind of two two generations of traders 
So there will be short-term traders with different trading times. And um, you can think of these as uh, yeah, different geographically located traders. For example, London traders who do not carry overnight inventory and when the trading day ends in London, these traders offload their position but not to anyone in London because no one in London has to ha wants to have inventory. But these traders offload their position to traders in New York, for example, who are more willing to carry inventory because the trading day in New York has only just begun at that time. So in this example, London traders will only care about the resale value of their holdings, of their position, to New York traders. So when London traders are buying stuff, they will have to form conjectures about how much New Yorkers will be willing to pay for London traders' positions. And this is the way in which second-order beliefs matter in this setting. And we will have public announcements, but also, but um, these public signals will also be in a somewhat interesting way. So you need to model them in a particular way to generate interesting um, dynamics and non-trivial second-order beliefs. And what we will show in the very end is that more precise public information will lead to more disagreement among the traders about the value of the asset. And in particular, if I have high private signal about the value of the asset, I will think that the next trader, the New York trader, will have low value for the asset. So in, th in this sense, second-order beliefs will be diverging, depending on private information. And this kind of disagreement about both current value of the asset and the resale value of the asset will generate trade, will generate trading volume. And a question in chat. How from Andres? By the way, Andres, did I decipher your nickname correctly? Are you actually Andres? But in the, mile, in the meanwhile, I will read your question. Uh, can you explain how currency traders close their position? If they hold cash, it must be in some currency, I suppose. Uh, yeah, so I guess it, it depends on the market, and I have not specified which, which market we're talking about. But if we're talking about... Uh, yeah, in... in Foreign exchange markets, it's not trivial what it means to close your position, right? Because you do need to hold some cash. In stock markets or bond markets or derivatives markets, you do have some home currency, I guess, that you consider safe. So euros in the in Europe, maybe pounds in, in the UK, and dollars in the US, of course. Uh, but that you do consider kind of safe, that you do consider the the benchmark. But um, what I mean by close your position is you, do, you don't want to hold, uh, yeah, all those stocks or derivatives or bonds, so whatever else you have. Or alternatively, if you're doing leveraged uh, FX trading, then you want to close down the leverage. Meaning if you borrowed some money, you want to repay that money by the end of the day. And that will be, of course, in the, in the uh, currency that you borrowed it. So I guess you can think of closing out the leverage as closing out the position. Okay, so this is the outline of the model. We will dive right into it. Yes, starting with a simple example, right after this break. So if there are any more questions, please ask them throughout the break and I'll get to them when we come back. But we will come back in five, six, maybe seven minutes.